Welcome to Inside Boxing Daily on the Gruley True Sports Network. Inside Boxing Daily is brought to you by the Sheridan Report. If you want to bet, you might as well have a little inside information. You should go check out Bobby Sheridan at the Sheridan Report. I'm your co-host for Inside Boxing Daily, Mike Goodpaster. Right now, I'd like to welcome in my co-host, who just today signed with the zone, Jeremiah Pricer. How you doing, Jeremiah? Yes, uh, good evening. Now I'm, I'm very happy about my signing. Uh, I'm going to be on the 140-pound uh, World Boxing Super Series tournament. I'll be I'll be real low on the totem pole, but you can catch me there. So yeah, tune in, guys. And this may be our last show because I am in talks with Top Rank and Bob Aram right now. <laughs> Yeah, and so yeah, me and Mike won't talk after this because yeah. you know we're we're pretty much on yeah. two sides of the train tracks. Yeah, and even if we want to do it, we can't do it because our promoters say we can't, and we're going to be bitches and not fight because of it. But with that being said, Deontay Wilder says he still intends on fighting on May 18th, whether it's against Tyson Fury or not. If Fury doesn't want to rematch, Wilder names the following contenders as contenders as options for his May 18th date: Dominic Brazil. That sounds exciting. Adam Konaki or Dillian White. Um, this is my worry, and this is what we've seen with everybody so far, pretty much. And that's that the big money contract Fury was given by Top Rank, which is like over 80 million pounds, which is 90 some million dollars. I mean, Fury doesn't lose anything if he prices him out, himself out of this fight, because he's still going to get. Mad Jack, as the kids would say, to fight, you know, as John Einreinhofer said when he texted me this morning, get ready for Sefer Seferit 2. Yep, get ready get ready for a mismatch special. That's, that's something might happen, you know. I mean, I, I have heard that they still want to keep the rematch intact and continue to negotiate and whatnot. At least that's, that's what I heard from Fury, so I'm, I'm hoping that's true. But, you know, with, uh, you know, the fight contract as is, I think they saw Fury uh, kind of like we were talking about, you know, when we were wondering uh, whether or not Joshua can be an American star. And I, I said that I think Joshua or I think Fury can be a bigger sell here than Joshua can. And again, that's partly because of his Irish identity. And not only that, because he, he comes across as authentic, you know, his story is more relatable to the average man than Joshua's, uh, you know, so I think they're, they're, they're trying to play that up as much as possible. And it's, it's a good move if they put him in against people worthwhile. But if you give me, you know, some mismatch, because one of those is coming, it, it's gotta be, I mean, we've just seen this too often for it, it not to happen. I mean, I would be genuinely surprised if you had Tyson Fury versus Wilder 2, and then, you know, he fights, uh, I don't know, White and – the winner of White in Brazil, and then, you know, he fights Anthony Joshua. I mean, that would be ideal, and I couldn't complain one bit if that happened. But it's just, you know, looking at the history of the sport, that's just not the way it typically works, you know? Uh, we typically get – you know, we'll, we'll get two soft touches – or, you know, like somebody who's is like a top 30 guy and like somebody who's not even ranked, uh, you know, and then we'll get one big fight. You know, so I don't know what to think about all this. I mean, you know, Fury is he does have potential if he can keep it all together, you know, but it's uh, it's I, I still think it's a big if, you know, a lot of these guys fall back into some of the issues that they had before. But maybe all the popularity and so many people getting behind him, he's he's, you know, turned the corner and he's changed his ways and. This will turn out to be something good, but, uh, you know, time will tell. But I, I really hope that the, the Wilder rematch gets made. I mean, I, I don't really want to see anything before that. I mean, there's no need to. I mean, boxing has a history as well of messing up whenever it has momentum. So, you know, you have a lot of people tune in for a pay-per-view buy or whatnot. Uh, you know, you have a good fight. Okay, in, that doesn't necessarily indicate that something good is going to follow afterwards. I mean, many times the, a good fight is marred by a bad decision or or whatever it may be. So I, I don't know what we're, you know, going to get here, but I hope it's a Wilder rematch. Yeah, and I don't worry about Wilder. I think he's going to fight one of those three guys, which <laughs> I'm not big on Brazil. I would love to see the Konaki fight. I'm not against the White fight. But we need to see the Fury fight because no matter what Deontay says, he lost that fight. And well, yeah, well, I mean, you. Yeah. No, I was going to say you look at the 
two prominent rankings organizations and in, in transnational in the ring and both of them promoted Tyson Fury. I mean, uh, when you're talking about, you know, tens of of, you know, journalists and, and you know, hardcore fans who follow the sport and they're it's all you know, well, at least on the transnational side, I was it was you not unanimous. Nobody yeah. thought that Wilder won the fight. Yeah, and I'm just worried that top rank will have their own ideas about what they want to do with him because they paid him so much money to fight. Because what happens if you pay him all that money and he comes out and gets knocked out in the first round? Yeah, right. Yeah, I know. What if that does happen? And you never know with heavyweights, right? I mean, I think that's why so many people are drawn to the division itself because you're more likely to have upsets like that. And and that's why, you know, Bob Arum with his – uh, he said that he's changed his ways, though I'm not exactly sure. He said he's changed his ways about marinating fights, you know, where he's, he's taken too long, right? You look at the numerous examples between, uh, uh, what was the big one, uh, Gamboa and uh, Lopez, you know, and the list goes on and on, right? So he said that he's not into marinating fights as much as he used to be, and he said this a few years back. So I'm hoping he realizes that, that's the best thing to do. Just get the Wilder rematch. If you beat Wilder, clearly, I actually think that Fury signing this contract helps his uh, helps his scorecards. You know, because now he's he's going to be seen as at least partly an American product. You know, I mean, because he's he's co- he has a co promotional deal with, or Frank Frank Warren has a co promotional deal with uh, Bob Arum, who's who's a you know big swing and wiener in the the division. So yeah, I think this this bodes well for his future if they get the Wilder rematch. But I I don't know, you know. Yeah, I just I don't think we're gonna see it, and it, it goes back to the same thing in the seventies and eighties. If fighters wanted to make fights, they demanded it until they got it. And it just doesn't happen anymore. And it goes back to what Vanis Martirosian told us last week. You know, yeah, bunch and, of company men. Yeah. And ain't nobody got the balls to just go out and say, hey, I want to fight this. All right. Billy Joe Saunders is going to move up to 168. And he is going to get the fight for the vacant title. And I'm going to say this name, of the person he's fighting, just the way it looks to me. She fat. <laughs> Izufi. So she fat Izufi, <laughs> who's 27 and 3 with two draws and 20 knockouts. They're going to fight for the vacant. Guess what it is, Jeremiah? Well, I, I could guess, even if I didn't already know, if I didn't already <laughs> see this headline, I would already know what it is. A, because Billy Joe Saunders already held the WBO trinket. And secondly, because the guy is, is fighting out of Germany. So. The WBO has been real kind, not only to the Brits, but the Germans. And we saw that with guys like Arthur Abraham and, and uh, you know, folks like that. So I'm not surprised one bit here. But his record seems to indicate that he can punch a little bit. But then, of course, you go down the line of people that he's fought and, uh, you know, you ask yourself who he actually beat. And, uh, yeah, it looks pretty, uh, pretty barren here. I don't see any names that – uh, how how does the guy get the the title shot? That's the I can Jesus. tell you how. Oh well, because he I wa- can tell you how because they made she fat the number one contender, so then they could get Billy Joe Saunders to come up, steal a trinket, and then drop back down to middleweight, which is what he says he's going to do, because he said today that he's still fighting in the middleweight division and will return to that division in the future. But the immediate objective for Saunders is to win the vacant WBO middleweight title. Oh God. And then we got to listen. Guy named Shefat. Yeah, well, and then we got to listen to claims of him being a two division, quote unquote champion. I mean, this is this is just nonsense. I mean, no, Saunders a along with guy. Yet. Yeah, he's never been that. Uh, you know, don't don't give me this alphabet nonsense and you know conflate it. Uh, you know, holding a, an alphabet trinket with with being a champion. The, the dude has never been that. And it's unfortunate that he has to do a bunch of stupid crap because it, the guy does have legitimate talent, but he, he's he's messing it all away with all these over the weight fights and you know you know the substances and you know just doing all these stupid videos and I, you know I just kind of. I got to give this to you real quick. Right, the press release. Saunders had planned on defending his WBO 160 pound title against his mandatory challenger. 
Demetrius Andrade. Now tell me what's wrong with this sentence, Jeremiah. On October 20th at TD Garden in Boston, the American Andrade won the vacant WBO middleweight strap, beating Walter, whatever the hell that guy's name is, by a 10-round unanimous decision on October 20th. Andrade has since defended the WBO title once. Okay, so Andrade, <laughs> so you're, there's a few things to pick at it. So you're saying that yeah. Andrade won a 10 round decision for a oh, title. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Saunders was somehow able to de- able but to Saunders defend was. a title that was yeah. allegedly vacant. They're the champion at the same time, but Andrade is the mandatory. Oh, God, this is this is just nonsense. It's yeah. Stupid. Okay. Yeah, and, and over again, over and over again we go. But now this is Frank Warren's doing. This is him maneuvering him into a shot. How convenient is it for Gilberto Ramirez to move up and vacate at this time? I'm, I'm sure that Frankie Warren was, you know, on the telephone with whoever runs that organization. It was like, hey, you know, Ramirez has said this. You know, let's let's just have him vacate his his belt now, and and then then we'll go. I mean, come on, this guy is not deserving. He's beaten nobody of note. I've never heard of the guy before ever. Right, uh, I follow. Got Bach. an awesome name though, Shefat. Yeah, he does. I'm sure he says it yeah, in a well, different way, from... but from now on, just in protest of the WBO and all this other bullshit, to me from here on out, his name's Shefat. That's it. No last name. That's it. Shefat. Yeah, and we know that Ramirez didn't vacate the title on his own, probably. No, no, I'm sure he had a little nudging. I mean, he did say before this that he was going to move up. I mean, he did say it after the Jesse Hart fight, but of course, you know, with yeah, all the politics you, going on, you know. How get a title shot in a division he hasn't fought in against a guy who's beaten nobody in that division? Uh, well, well, technically, Saunders did fight at 168 in his last fight against Rafael Sosa Pintos. <laughs> I guess Rafael Sosa yeah. Pintos, and now he's going to fight Shefat. So he fights all the cool kids at 168. Oh, sorry. No, actually, I was I was wrong there. Actually, uh, Saunders' last fight was technically at cruiserweight. So uh, I don't know how they. Uh, but that's the point: is that there is no need to justify it. it. It's all about just guys playing ball with one another and you know keeping the the, the shit in court and again get you know. Don and their guys with, you know, shiny pieces of leather and metal. But where, where is the, she fat ranked on box rack out of all super middle ways? <clears throat> yeah, that would uh, – let me let me check real quick because that would be interesting. Not, I bet he's not even in the top 20. He is – let's see. He's th- number 33. So, <laughs> yeah, he's – Dude, he's, he's, ranked, he's ranked sixth in his division in Germany. <laughs> so he's the sixth ranked German super middleweight, but he's ranked number one by the world boxing odor. Yep. Well, and to be honest with you, I looked at the German rankings just to see who exactly they had, and those guys are better than him, I assume. I mean, Jurgen Brammer, who is in the world yeah. boxing super series, he, he comes up on top. Of course, he got he got injured, so they never went through with that match. Uh, Vincent Fagan boots. He's he's he can crack, but he's not going anywhere. Arthur Abraham, who we all recognize, but Tyron Zuga or whatever his name, however you pronounce his name, he he's better. I mean, you know, I I don't. Again, I, even trying to follow the logic, Dude, all right, you really got to do right is below Arthur Abraham, and he's getting a title shot. Yeah, exactly. Well, and Abraham has been you know past his best for uh, what I don't know forever now. <laughs> I mean, yeah. uh, Abraham, Abraham only had one fight last year. So it, anyways, all you got to do, listen, if, if you're listening to the show, don't try to don't try to follow the logic. OK, because right, you don't have to piece this thing together like a detective where you have, you know, a bunch of pictures on the wall and, you know, you're trying to attach the strings to the, you know, the pictures and make the connections. Look, just follow the money and follow the political associations. It's all you need to do. Pretty much. All right. So we figured we'd have fun with something that you brought up this weekend on social media or somebody else brought up. You had the argument with them. And that is who is the greatest cruiserweight in the history of the division. The division's been around since 1979, 1980, been ranked by the ring since 1983. 
Um, and you had somebody argue that Usyk was the greatest cruiserweight better than Holyfield, correct? Yeah, well, and it was pretty much put in this manner. Okay, so Usyk is the greatest cruiserweight ever. Change my mind, okay? And so he's working on the presumption that, you know, that Usyk, in fact, is the greatest. And he's not the only one making this argument, to be honest with you. Uh, I've seen a number of folks, you know, justifying this. And, uh, you know, it's not the the largest leap of logic I've ever seen, but I, I just don't buy it. A, because... Holyfield, no matter what you say about Usyk, let's imagine that you say Usyk is more accomplished than Holyfield. Let's just imagine, right? Because Usyk has has done a number of things that have been in the public eye, right? I mean, Holyfield didn't have a world boxing super series to, you know, to unify his trinkets. Of course, there were less back then. Uh, You know, he didn't have to go into all these. It, It wasn't of course, this will be one of my one of my arguments. But you know, Usyk was traveling to all these guys' hometowns, and and he made uh, usually the best guys or guys who were perceived as the best guys he was going to fight. Typically, he did beat them clearly and definitively. And it's been a long time. Actually, I, I don't think we've had a uh, a real cruiserweight champion since two thousand seven or two thousand eight, and that was Tomas Adamic um, when he. He created the line by beating uh, Steve Cunningham, who we, we've had on the show a couple times. Uh, and then he defended once, I believe, against Jonathan Banks. And then that was that. He moved up to heavyweight and, you know, eventually got the Klitschko fight. So my thing is this, is even if you, uh, you know, admire the circumstances by which Usyk has gotten it all done, I mean, he's done it very quickly, right? He's You can compare that there, right, in terms of, how quickly they became the man in the division, right? There's some comparison there. But when you break it all down and look at their work, Holyfield is one of the greatest heavyweights to ever do it. Usyk is, his work is by and large just confined to the cruiserweight to division. seen what he does above that. But the question it, is exactly. this. All right. And, and I've seen plenty of people argue this before. And they argue that heavyweight doesn't matter. You're just talking about what they've done in the cruiserweight division. Well, no, because it, it doesn't. I mean, I, I think if you ask any historian, you know, what sort of weight that adds to their merit, uh, I think it, it's significant. I mean, that's why, uh, you know, you look at Benny Leonard and, and Roberto Duran, and you, you might say, oh, well, Benny Leonard. Uh, you know, had a better resume, but he, he's lesser pound for pound because he didn't accomplish as much at a higher weight. But moving up in weight and showing that you can still be dominant then is a sign of how good you actually are, right? It is a testament to your ability. It is a testament to your skill, uh, right? It, it's a testament. Not, not only that, especially when you move up, you're giving up advantages that you had in a lower division. And so, so you know, to still compete at a high level, again, shows the goods, right? So Holyfield was able to move up. He was able to take, you know, crisp, crisp clean shots from, from bona fide heavyweight punchers. Yeah, George uh, Foreman, it doesn't get much harder than that. Right, and he was barely blinking with, you know, some of these shots that he was taking, right? And, and not only that, he was fighting in an era, uh, a good era, you know? So uh, I, it does matter, and I think most people would agree with you and I that, it does. It, it is something that you would have to factor in. And even if you don't uh, factor it in, if you just go based on their their uh, their um, resume at Cruiserweight, Holyfield is still better. I mean, now, OK, so I you know, even if, so if you go to head to head, go to head to head matchups, Holyfield's the better guy. Right. Usyk is a fine boxer. I like him. In fact, I've been saying for years that I think Usyk is the 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 best cruiserweight I've seen? Oh, I think, or I think he would be the best the heavyweight champion of the world within the next couple of years. Yeah, I I said that when he was coming up before he ever made his mark on the division, really made a uh, an imprint. I said that I think he's the the best cruiserweight. W- w- he'll become the best cruiserweight since Holyfield. But when you look at the head to head matchups, the vast majority of us are going to favor Holyfield, right? Like you, like we talked about off air. You know, fifteen rounds. You know, scorching heat. You know, we're talking about uh, you know making the fight, and in, in, it doesn't really matter where it's. You know, we Usyk was able to travel, but people people who are arguing for Usyk forget that 
the division was not European heavy when it started out. These guys were by and large American, right? Carlos de Leon, well, I think he was Puerto Rican, right? That's the USA. Uh, Marvin Camel, USA. Um, <clears throat> all, you know, guys that they well, fought. As- yeah, Ocasio, Puerto Rico. Um, but this is my thing. When, when you look at the competition, uh, you look at even the second fight that Holyfield had against Eric Winbush. That's the Winbush that ended Matthew Saad Muhammad's career. Had an upset winner here or there. Um, Tyrone Booz was a decent fighter. Anthony Davis was the guy that was ranked, uh, would you say, number three in 1983 by the Ring Magazine. Shoshande Mute was a former cruiserweight champion, or he won a cruiserweight championship afterwards. I can't remember which, but it was right about the time he did. He had a great fight with Leroy Murphy where they had a double knockdown in it. And I th- it was actually the fight before he fought Evander Holyfield. Shoshana Mute lost by KO in the final round to Leroy Murphy. So, I mean, this is a guy that was definitely a top 10 guy, and that is in Holyfield's, what, maybe 10th fight, something like that. Hold on, let me look. Well, yeah, he beat he beat Anthony Davis in like his seventh or eighth fight. Yeah, and then he beat Muti after that. Um, Jesse Selby, Terry mm. Mims. But Dwight Muhammad Kwawi, I'm sorry, guys. But if you think that Breedis or I don't even remember the other guy's names, but if you think Breedis or guys like that are going to beat Dwight Muhammad Kwawi in a 15-round fight, you're nuts. I mean, Dwight no, Muhammad you... Kwawi was a great light heavyweight. I mean, this is a dude that wore out Matthew Saad Muhammad twice, Jerry the Bull Martin, um, stopped, basically ended James Scott's dreams at Rawway State Prison. And, you know, this was a tough man. And Evander Holyfield went toe-to-toe in, like, his 12th fight with him, and he beat him. Right, yeah, and it's it's what do you – if you put Gassiev or, or Bradis in a, in a fight like that in the, in the first uh, Holyfield – Kawi fight, they're they're not coming out of there. I, I you know it's yeah Gassiev is technical. I, I do like Gassiev, right? I mean he's technical. He's still pretty young. He's got good punch and power. You know he's had some highlight reel knockouts, but he's not. You, you again you go back to uh, Kawi's work at 175, and not only the names that you listed, but what about uh, uh, who's the guy who gave Michael Spinks all made him look bad? Eddie Davis. Yes, Eddie Davis, well, he right? Beat Eddie Davis and Johnny Davis. I mean, right. he, beat he, he beat Eddie Davis then. by. Yeah, I, I think he beat Eddie Davis by eleventh round knockout. And again, this is a guy who made Michael Spinks look bad. I mean, these, uh, I, he beat, he beat up, I think Rossman. Uh, I mean, this guy was yeah. a da- a damn he good. Much ended Rossman. Um, yeah. On top of that, if you go to Ozzy Ocasio. You can look at Ozzy Ocasio. This is a man that at heavyweight beat Jimmy Young twice. Um, lost a title bid to Holmes. Everybody lost to Holmes then. He got a draw with Michael Dokes. Uh, so he wasn't a pushover. And no, actually, I... that fight, I think, was in France when he fought Ocasio. Yeah, I would add that, you, you know, you're you're teasing out some of the details of these guys' resumes. So Carlos De, De Leon was obviously a, a damn good cruiserweight, too. So if you look at uh, De Leon's resume, he lost to a guy named S.T. Gordon. And most of us, uh, you know, most of regular fans are like, you know, never heard of the guy, don't know who he I is. Go look, his, go look at his hey, resume. S.T. Gordon, the, you dude, know he, what I remember about S.T. Gordon, though? is the first time I ever saw Jerry Cooney fight, it was on network TV against S.T. Gordon. Nobody had ever heard of it, but heard of S.T. Gordon. And Gordon ran and eventually quit. And then after that, he dropped down to cruiserweight, and he was a solid fighter. And he, I think he went to distance with, like, Trevor Burbick or somebody too, didn't he? Yeah, he, so he actually beat Trevor Burbick. Okay, that's what it was. Yeah, so he beat Trevor Burbick before uh... – uh, Burbick ever so he beat Burbick and then Burbick went on to win uh, an alphabet trinket against Pinklin Thomas yeah and Carlos De Leon was a damn good fighter and to even put Breedis in it put it like this Breedis is not going to be ranked right now a top 10 cruiserweight of all time I don't think you can find a list of any boxing historian that knows anything that is not going to have Carlos De Leon probably in your top 5 but at least the top 10. And when you look at this, I mean, you, you go a little deeper into his career. 
This is a guy, De Leon, who in 1990, when he's, shit, I don't know, 15, what year did he start? He started in 74. 16 years into his career, he is going to Great Britain and fighting a draw with Johnny Nelson, who was a damn good fighter, who was a lot closer to his prime than he was at that point. Yeah, well, and it's it's if you if you look at a lot of cruiserweight lists, De Leon was I think viewed as number two for many many years. I mean, I don't see a lot of people making up these lists. Yeah, my, um, I, you know, I think the only list you saw was probably mine. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, De Leon was number two easily on my list, and I mean, Breedus and them do not they don't get close to that. I mean, you got to remember also Quawi. I mean, he almost. Or De Leon also beat the hell out of Leon Spinks. Um, he beat Marvin Camel. I had Marvin Camel on a couple weeks ago. Marvin Camel was a damn good fighter, and he got a close points win the first time, and he actually stopped Camel the second time. Um, and, and you just look at their careers. I mean, you talked about Eddie Davis. Yeah, De Leon beat Davis also. He beat Davis twice. So when you look at these guys. I don't think, I think when people look at it, they just see Dwight Muhammad Kwawi. But there was more on Evander Holyfield's resume at Cruiserweight than Dwight Muhammad Kwawi. Well, and to be honest with you, I think I think Dwight is, is kind of like the trump card anyways because Gassiev and Bredis are, they haven't shown they're on that level. I mean, yeah, this was a, a Dwight Muhammad Kwawi who was not at his best. But when you look at how well he fought against Holyfield in the first fight, this is obviously a guy who's still very good. And he also won an, an alphabet trinket at cruiserweight. You know, so it's not uh, it's not as if, the, you know, the guy just blew up and, and then he just, uh, you know, it was just downward slide since then. No, this was still a damn good Kawi. And to me, that's again, that's it's a bit of the trump card where. Usyk is not going to fight a guy of that level unless somehow, you know, Gossi of. Uh, you know, learns from his mistakes and is real. Not to fight a guy at that level, not at cruiserweight. There's nobody there. There's no way you can learn from your mistakes and become Dwight Muhammad Kwawi if you're Martin Bredis. Just not gonna happen. Yeah, well, I, well, and the thing about Bredis too is Bredis is is more proven, uh, well, arguably more proven than Gassiev. I mean, Gassiev did have a close, but I think substantial win over Dennis Lebedev, who was a damn good cruiserweight himself. But Bredis, of course, did significantly better against Usyk than Gassiev did. And then we saw in the World Boxing Super Series, the the second cruiserweight tournament, Gassiev uh, kind of got a hand-me-down when he when he uh, should have lost uh, to Noel Gavor, who I, I think everybody everybody I saw had had winning that fight. But I'm looking looking at some of these lists to just kind of get a feel of of where everybody places. So, you know, boxing news, right? It's been around since 1909. They've got a cruiserweight list, and it's Vander Holyfield, number one, Carlos De, De Leon, number two. So they also have Kawi at five. So if I think boxing news is a good source, right? This isn't some Joe Schmo on Ranker, you know, where it's a popularity contest. You yeah, know, so, so we're talking about – Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we have uh, Evander Holyfield knocking out two top five cruiserweights ever. Usyk, he he doesn't have that, and he's likely not going to have that. Uh, let's see if I can find some other lists. You know, some of these uh, got ranker. Don't even want to go there. Boxing twenty four seven. Wonder if uh, I wonder if the ring ever rated some of these guys. Oh, geez, I guess ESPN even – somebody on ESPN even wrote an article of why Usyk is the greatest ever. Ah, here we go. I'm going to use a boxing scene. So I think Cliff Roll did a lot of good lists back in the day. I, so back in – I think 2008 to 2010. Uh, I could be mistaken there. But he did some really interesting lists where uh, uh, he was – he did a lot of this resume-based stuff where he was ranking guys. So let's, let's see what he has. I, I like Cliff. Um, let's see. So Holyfield, obviously number one, no debate there. Carlos De Leon, number two. Wow, surprise, surprise, right? So in, in fact, it's uh, he, he breaks us down statistically. So De Leon was a three-time Lineal world yeah, champion over a decade. I had mean, seven, yeah, had seven. Yeah, so he had um, 
let's see. He had he fought seven titleist slash champions. Uh, Marvin Camel, S.D. Gordon, uh, Ratliff, who was also highly rated in number uh, in 1983. I think he was number six. Uh, Benton, uh, Holyfield, Nelson, and Duran. So that's that's pretty impressive resume. Who do we got at three? Let's see. So Johnny Nelson actually comes in at <laughs> number three. So yeah. so who they be? so <clears throat> or who well they be? so so uh, who did Johnny Nelson beat? No, I mean basically Carlos De Leon. I thought Drew beat him. Johnny Nelson, but it was called a draw. It was in Great Britain, and that was in right. 1990. That was when Nelson was a lot closer to his peak than De Leon was. Right, so we have De Leon drawing with, uh, you know, arguably the third greatest cruiserweight ever. Well, I, I don't think he would go that far now. I mean, uh, I wouldn't place, you know, Johnny Nelson over Usyk at this point. But, you know, we're still talking about guys beating uh, some of the best fighters to ever grace their division and so, uh, I, again, I just don't see the argument for it. You know, head-to-head, Kawi is going to win that one. I mean, sorry, <clears throat> Holyfield should win against Usyk. Resume. Here's another po- a sticking point that I, I found, is that Holyfield knocked out every single yeah. notable person that he fought at heavyweight. The only person he did not knock out is Kawi, who is tough as old boots. You mean the cruiserweight. Fir- exactly. And that but was he did first- knock him out the second time. Exactly. So technically he did, you know, beat a knockout at every, you know, he, there was only one person who lasted the distance with him. And that was Kawi. And he got him in the second go round. Nah, his so, first two fights were decisions. No, well, yeah, that's why, that's why I said every significant person. I'm, I'm basically meeting any, well, really, anywhere really, from Anthony Davis. Three guys that went the distance with him. Yeah. Well, and again, once he got to the world level, he he knocked out everybody but Kawi. I'm pretty much counting anything from the, uh, I think, the Anthony Davis fight until he moves up to heavyweight. He, yeah. he knocked out every single notable person, again, except the first Kawi fight. Usyk has not done that. Usyk has been taken to a decision a number of times. And Usyk, again, he's looked very good against Gassiev. He looked very good against uh, Glowacki. Uh, he, he looked very good against um, uh, Huck, right? Uh, but he didn't get stoppages in some of his more notable fights, right? He didn't stop Glowacki. He didn't stop Gassiev. Um, you know, he he didn't stop Michael Hunter, who you know uh, he he you know he had he was in against Munchu, who was uh, I don't know, I'm not sure if that's how you say it, but uh, he was a little awkward, and it, you know it took uh, it seemed like a, a little too long to get him out of there. So Holyfield went out there and got the job done at a higher level than Usyk did. I, I, I can't. I, I think this debate is settled. Okay, it's settled. We're right and everybody else is wrong. But that that is true. So, I mean, when you look at it, Holyfield could crack. And he's a better. Put it like this. If you put them both in the same ring at the end of their cruiserweight reigns, I don't think even the people that are trying to say Usyk was better than Holyfield would really bet money that Usyk could beat Holyfield. No, I don't think so either. And, and that, that's sort of what ended the conversation with me and uh, this fellow who, who was cordial in his exchange. You know, he wasn't confrontational. But I asked him who he'd favor in that fight because at first he said he didn't know. And I was like, well, OK, give me a definitive answer. You know, so I can work off that. He just kept ignoring the question. And so to me, that's telling. But I will say that I don't have a problem with ranking Usyk very highly at cruiserweight because you look at his circumstance, especially in comparison to cruiserweights in the past. Right. I mean, who do we have before Lebedev? You know, he's a good fighter. Right. We had Tomas Adamic, who is the last uh, cruiserweight champion. But Usyk is 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 unique you know, s- since Holyfield's time, well, I'll I mean, give you this. I he's think moved Usyk up here. Is number two or number three, one or two. Uh, yeah, exactly. And I think I wouldn't, again, I wouldn't have a problem with anybody putting him number two because uh, most of us like to see uh, dominance, right? And, and Usyk has not been knocked off by like an ST Gordon type to his credit or an Acasio or somebody like that. So 
I don't have a problem with him being number two. I think he's very good, right? He's crafty. I mean, his, his engine's good. Uh, you know, the fact that he's been a traveling champion in an era when so many guys went home field advantage, it's admirable. I mean, the you know, the World Boxing Super Series has really done a lot for his brand, and now he's, he's a recognizable figure. And again, as an Eastern European in the cruiserweight division, which has kind of been, uh, you know, just a secondary division anyways for its entire history, that's why – Guys like Hay and and Holyfield and all these other guys generally move up, you know, to make the big money. But for Usyk to get this sort of recognition and, and deservedly so, um, you know, because of what he's been able to accomplish, again, I don't have any problem with putting him number two. But he's not Holyfield, okay? There are very few men in boxing history who are like Holyfield, and Usyk would have to do a hell of a lot to get anywhere near that. Yeah, and the big problem because he's not going to be fighting I, I a division know. that's as deep as the nineties. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. I mean, he doesn't have the opportunity there with those guys. Maybe if he becomes the heavyweight champion and reigns for a decade. But, all right, on this day, and you've got, on this day, February 18th, 1989, what fight you got, Jeremiah? All right, well, you know, thanks to Steve Lott, because he always, you know, keeps people up to date with this sort of stuff. But the one I chose was fight that I'd seen not too long ago, and, and one of these guys was a guest on our show not that long ago either. So it's uh, Pernell Sweet Pea Whitaker versus Greg Haugen. Uh, you know, anybody who's seen the fight, you know, there was no controversy in the decision. Yeah, but the Whitaker thing was... I remember is this. The thing I remember about this is if you saw the fight in 1989 and you thought about it now, you'd think, well, Whitaker just danced and just beat the hell out of him. But the thing that I remember about that fight was he came out, stood right in front of Haugen, made Haugen miss, and just beat the dog shit out of Haugen. Yeah, Haugen was pretty uh, – <clears throat> Haugen, as good as, as he could be, he was pretty timid pretty quickly. You know, he was just befuddled, you know, because like you said, Whitaker could stand there and make him miss all night long and just pepper him with counter shots. And it's not – you know, Whitaker's in the record seems to indicate that – he wasn't a big puncher, and he wasn't a big puncher, but he could crack pretty good, right? I mean, yeah, we did see, yeah, yeah, like, like when he needed to bail himself against Hurtado, he got the job done. You know, I mean, Whitaker hit hard enough, hit hard enough to get a guy's respect, and he certainly hit hard enough to stop a guy if he wanted to. Again, he's not going to one shot knock you out. But uh, you know, like you look at some of his uh, some of his body work, which is Mike and I have. Man, we've we've been on about this, I think, at a number of shows where Whitaker constantly gets touted as, you know, one of the greatest defensive fighters ever, but he was far more than that. I mean, his jab was superb, and actually, i got to give Max Kellerman credit in that regard. He has, you know, for many years, he was high on Whitaker's, Whitaker's jab, which was, was phenomenal. I mean, it was technical, it was active, uh, you know, it, it was it was accurate, you know, he didn't uh, you know, he it wasn't always coming off the same way. His body punching is underrated. I mean, go go watch the Jake Rodriguez fight. He beat that body like a drum. And you know, the thing with Haugen is just he couldn't hit him. I mean, every he was just outsmarted. It was like a it was like me versus uh, you know the world's best chess player. You know, I'm just I got no chance there. And that's that's what it was in this fight. It was a mismatch. But you know, Whitaker boxed beautifully. I mean, the man was really something to behold. Yeah. I still think he'd have taken Duran at lightweight. Yeah, I, I know a number of guys who would probably agree with you, but of course, you know there does seem to be a Duran brigade <clears throat> brigade who hold him, uh, you know, in, in real high regard. And, and again, I know I'm not saying that Duran wasn't a great lightweight and whatnot, but le, le, he wasn't. I don't think he was unbeatable at lightweight. You know, is is well, he is, wasn't because mi- Esteban de Jesus beat him. <laughs> right, when de Jesus was a boxer, right? Yeah, and uh, when I look at it, uh, the other thing about Whitaker is this. Whitaker was more impressive moving up to welterweight than what Duran was. That may sound nuts, but you look, I mean, he dominated people at welterweight also, uh, including Buddy McGirt, who was a hell of a fighter. He dominated, he beat Buddy's ass twice. Um, He dominated Chavez. I don't care what anybody says. He kicked Chavez's ass. Um... Gary Jacobs was a decent fighter. Jake Rodriguez, he beat the hell out of Wilfredo Rivera. He beat him, I think, twice. Um, Hurtado, 
The De La Hoya fight was close. Actually, I thought De La Hoya won that. But the fight that stuck out to me, stuck out to me was when the reflexes and stuff were kind of gone. In 1999, he still gave Felix Trinidad a handful, even though he lost almost every round. It wasn't by much every round. No, it wasn't. Well, and to be honest with you, Whitaker, as faded as he was at that point, he was still ranked, I think, uh, number five going into that fight. I could be wrong. I, you know, I'd have to check the sources, but I think he was number five. I mean, that, that shows you how damn good. I mean, this guy was, you know, blow, you know, blown out on Coke at that, at that time. And <laughs> I mean, you could see that you could, you could clearly see, you could uh, clearly see the slippage in um, the Hurtado fight. Cause he was losing that right in his prime. I don't think he has, you know, Hurtado was kind of a quirky guy, you know, and, and gave, he even gave Costa Zoo trouble. So he, he was a guy who could fight for sure. I mean, he had a long amateur background and, and, you know, he could box a bit and hit a little bit. Uh, but you know, Whitaker isn't struggling that much if he's at his best, but, you know, so for me, that was uh, one of the times that, uh, you know, you just saw clear signs that he was on his way out and he still managed to, I mean, and a lot of people argue that he beat De La Hoya. I, I'm, I'm with you, uh, you know, and, and then I thought De La Hoya came on no, strong. I, I do it, think it was close, but I did think De La Hoya won the fight. Well, and I think, but I still think that's highly impressive in itself. I mean, we're talking about a faded, yeah, you know, re- 13, 14 years into his career. Right. Yeah. He, he, he's regressing at that point and he arguably beats Oscar De La Hoya. I mean, De La Hoya was a great fighter at his best. Uh, again, I know a lot of people like to give him shit because, you know, the way he's promoted himself and, you know, stuck his nose in everybody's business and, you know, talks crap on Twitter or whatnot. But the way he uses uh, kitchen utensils, all that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> and fishing utensils, yeah. Yeah, um, and rudder belts uh, and leggings and stockings and dildos and whatever else he uses. But that's up to Oscar, whatever he wants to do. Well, yeah, yeah, and it, you know, to to be honest, I'd, whatever he's doing in the within the confines of his bedroom with a prostitute is that's that's his. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that's his to own. I mean, but. Uh, you know, there are a lot of boxers who have done worse, you know, and we don't give them half the amount of flack that Oscar gets. And, and again, that, that is because Oscar's in the spotlight so often. But Whitaker was damn good. Uh, I mean, the, the guy, the guy's a modern legend for sure. You know, so the Haugen, you know, just wasn't on that level. And like you said, the Chavez fight was was a, just a beautiful display of, of pure boxing from him. And it wasn't even close. You know, I mean, and I think. Most people realize that even, you know, even Sports Illustrated ran the headline, hey, this this was a damn robbery. So the fact that a lot of people argue that Chavez is the greatest Mexican fighter ever and Whitaker was that much better than him puts things into perspective. Yeah, because there's no way Chavez won more than two or three rounds against him, if any. No. No, I, I, I don't know if I gave him any. Maybe the same I'd have to go back and watch. The Jose thing. Luis Ramirez, who he lost the first fight to, still the worst decision I think I've ever seen. The second fight, I don't even think Ramirez touched him the entire fight. He dominated Azuma Nelson. Um, Buddy McGirt gave him trouble, I think, the first fight. Second fight, Whitaker dominated him. So I, I don't think there's any great. And Greg Haugen, he dominated Greg Haugen. And no matter what Greg Haugen's limitations were, he was still a damn good fighter. Yeah, he was. And and I often wonder, you know, pe- people who, especially, I'm, I'm talking about real new fans who are on the Mayweather bandwagon. I, I wonder, you know, what they would think of, of Whitaker and, and his resume, like how some people put it into perspective. Like, how do you compare, you know, Floyd with, with Whitaker? Right? Like, how do you tease out the details and, and rank one higher than the other? Because, you know, they're they're – boxing guys you know they're more defensive minded but obviously they both had very good offenses as well but you know like when you think of the best guys the best best fighters of the last you know 30 years or so or you know since the 90s uh, you know for me it's it's guys like Roy Jones Whitaker obviously Mayweather and Pacquiao are up there as well but I'd like to see some of these guys where they rank Whitaker you know because they probably do themselves well by going back and and looking at some of those fights because guys like Ramirez were not he wasn't a bum uh Ramirez he uh yeah didn't he uh knock out Rosario in the second fight I think he lost the first one but then knocked him out in the fourth and so much with Rosario um went the distance with Hector Camacho was it? I, I, he went the distance with Ray Mancini before Mancini got the title. I think he went to Youngstown, Ohio to do that, too. 
So, yeah, he was a good fighter. Um, at lightweight, if Mayweather fights Whitaker, that would be very interesting. Very. Very boring, too, but it'd be very interesting all at the same time. Yeah, well, to, for me, it's I've always wanted to see – I've actually always wanted to see Mayweather fight a boring slickster type who's a southpaw. You know, I – uh, you know, there there are people who say, well, Southpaws give Mayweather trouble. I do think there's a little something to that. You know, you look at the Judah fight and see how effective he was for the first four rounds. But he was, he was always a front runner and could never maintain. Yeah. And you never, you never know. Just with – Judah was not bright, you know, so he was probably going to lose that fight anyways. Again, I think Mayweather probably would have adjusted and, and figured him out regardless. But – you know, guys like Stevie Johnson and, and uh, Joel Casamayor at 130-135, those are two guys that I really wanted to see Mayweather fight because they presented that option to him where they they were you know, smarter and slicker and quicker. And, and you know, a lot, a lot of people would f- favor Mayweather over both those guys. But, you know, Whitaker is just a different animal altogether. And it, that's a, it's sort of a dream matchup for me, you know, even though it would be boring. But it is one of those – modern matchups you think about quite a bit and wonder how it would go interesting how about that yes yeah very tactical yes yeah and i think that in the end whitaker would have taken a lot more chances and whitaker wasn't as apt to dance around the ring so much i think whitaker would have taken him but uh it's according who the judges are and who's buying the judges i guess um all right guys you got anything else before we wrap it up tonight no, I mean, there there really hasn't been much going around boxing circles. I mean, we're just kind of playing it day by day right now. And again, I, I haven't heard much of anything from, I mean, it, it really seems like it's turning out to be a pretty crappy year. Uh, you know, 2019 has just not set up some good stuff for us, aside from the World Boxing Super Series and Canelo That's Jacobs. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that is a good fight. I mean, it, but there's few ideal matchups that we'd like to see. I mean, it would be nice to get Garcia Lomachenko or, you know, Spence Crawford. But, you know, we're just all playing the playing the waiting games and, you know, bitching about, you know, ESPN and, and you know, them paying Tyson Fury big amount of money. I, I don't know. Well, the hope is they all lose money, and at some point they just have to fight each other to be able to make some of that money back. Yeah, and you would think that they would get the hint. You know, after all these years, you'd think the promoters would figure out, hey, just putting the best versus the best is the best way to kind of get your guy notoriety and, and more money. But nope, nope. Now we got, uh, okay, now who's going to DAZN? Who's going to ESPN? Who's PBC? I mean, it's enough to make your head hurt, you know, especially because Heyman and Bob Arum don't like each other, you know, so they're not really playing ball with one another. You know, Eddie Hearn is, is willing to, you know, he's willing to give some and, you know, take some. So, you know, you got to credit him a little bit. And Frank Warren, you know, he's uh, he's not as big as Hearn, so he has to he has to concede as as well. But it's it's just it's one of these things like you just get factions and it just strikes me as odd that all these people kind of join the factions. You know, you have all these fans like, oh, well, uh, you know, they're either riding with Joshua or riding with Wilder or riding with this guy and riding with that guy. You know, f- forget all the, the con- contractual details, OK, because what a guy gets in his purse is really of little concern to you because you're not getting a cut. But the the bigger focus should be cleaning up the sport and just demanding that the best fight the best. I mean, people are constant. Boxing fans are pretty bitchy, right? And I'm not saying we don't do some of that here. Obviously, we do because of the state of things. But we we don't lack perspective. You know, a lot of these people are like, ah, oh, well, they're not fighting and – it's all these, you know, divi- uh, divisional rivalries, or it's it's this guy ducking that guy. There, there's just a lot of nonsense that's that's touted around, you know. Again, just it's it's just this big tribal stuff that you see. And again, we just just demand that the best fight the best. Don't don't worry so much about you know who signed to who and and you know how much this guy's getting paid. Just just focus on the stuff that's important. Well, I'm not Polish, but I'm riding with Konaki, so. Me too, baby. (laughs) All right, guys. We will be back tomorrow night at 11 o'clock Eastern on Inside Boxing Daily. So make sure you come back, check us out. Um, Make sure you go to iTunes, rate us. Go to YouTube, comment on us, rate us, comment us, give us something. 
Uh, we want to thank everybody who's listened over the last couple of weeks. We are here every Monday through Friday night at 11 o'clock Eastern Time. And on Sundays at 9 o'clock with John Ein Reinhofer, who I'm going to try to start a fight with about this Fury Wilder thing on <laughs> next Sunday night. So make sure, if you haven't heard it yet, Inside Boxing Weekly, where we preview the fights next week. Review last week's fights was done last night, so you can find that on thegruelingtruth.net also. Uh, remember, go to The Grueling Truth and follow our Facebook page. There is also a TGTN boxing page. Plus a TGTN Twitter page, which is at TGTN Boxing, correct, Jeremiah? That is correct. I mean, you know, follow the boxing page, follow the main page, uh, you know, go to all the social media par- portals and, and give us a follow. And again, don't don't be afraid to give us feedback on the show as well. I mean, if you, if you know somebody who has a nuanced argument about Usyk being the, the greatest cruiserweight ever, We'll bring him on and, and, you know, talk politely with him. We don't have any problem with that. Uh, you know, me and Mike are open-minded guys, and we're willing to absorb the data and, you know, mold and shape our views accordingly. But, uh, you know, we're we're willing to do that sort of stuff if that's what you want to hear. Yeah, and if you're stupid enough to think Mike Tyson could have beat Muhammad Ali, you can come argue that too. Um, <laughs> so we're going to we're gonna wrap the show up for tonight. Or if you think Floyd Mayweather would have beat Sugar Ray Leonard, we can shoot holes in that all day long too. So remember, you can hear all of our shows on iHeartRadio, YouTube, iTunes, TuneIn, Spreaker, Spotify. Tune in wherever you find sports podcasts. You'll find The Grueling Truth. So for Jeremiah Pricer, I'm Mike Goodpaster. You've been listening to The Grueling Truth, where the legends speak.